Good morning, Umpo. Good morning, Major Masako. So today is Tuesday, the 25th of May. Thank you for taking time to share some more Dhamma with us. Uh, some people have expressed a lot of appreciation and interest in the topic that you covered recently about self-righteousness. Could you speak some more about that and how to practice with it, please? Yes, it's an important issue in the human individual's life because <clears throat> right and wrong are very much conditioned into us, what's right, what's wrong. Even in the Eightfold Path Right View and Right Understanding, you see right as a kind of absolute, you know, a kind of absolute position to take. and. Uh, but in terms of reflection, <clears throat> right is, is a sankhara as well as wrong, you know. So wrong is, is, rises and ceases in the sense of being right as an individual. My view is right. <clears throat> Your view is all wrong. My side of the political spectrum is right and your side is all wrong. And, and in regarding to relationships, I'm right and you're wrong. And, you know, we see it in the Sangha, views about Vinay, about being right and wrong. And these can be, you know, really emphasized and taken into and grasped in, in to be a very kind of warlike argumentative position to take, to being righteous. And uh, just noticing in oneself this sense of I'm right, is awareness of that, that's because it's a created state. One does, nobody can feel right all the time, you know, that I'm right, you know, it arises according to other conditions. And so with awareness, mindfulness, our conscious awareness is our way of putting it into perspective. And so it can be right, but not true, true, but not right. And so these kind of conundrums, these koans are important to reflect upon, you know, because I've seen in, in monastic life, very righteous positions taken and, you know, about anyone who doesn't agree with them or take their interpretation of Dhamma Vinaya. Uh, and, and become very fixed and self-righteous, defensive and, and argumentative without being aware of what they're doing. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we can all feel, you know, like our tradition is right and our view of life is right and our political view uh, uh, is right. Or, you know, if you're on the left of the spectrum, <laughs> Is left is right and right, right is wrong. <laughs> you know, you get entangled in the whole uh, mental proliferation around right and wrong, where it's wisdom to see that right and wrong are not absolutes. There's no absolute right, no absolute wrong. And, and the word absolute is an interesting word because <clears throat> we tend to absolutize our positions, the sense of ourself, our life, and, and uh, we, we believe in absolutes, like God is an absolute or Dhamma is an absolute. And so uh, this is, this word itself is a sankara, absolute. And so we talk about the, the empty consciousness or voidness or pure awareness doesn't have any absolutes in it. It doesn't form absolutes with conditioned phenomena, with words, with, with ideas, with ideals, of taking fixed positions that are, you know, held to where it is quite self-destructive or destructive in relationships. So, you know, the freedom of of realizing that the one's conditioning 
cultural conditioning, religious conditioning is very righteous. You know, so it's, and religions are all about right, being right and absolute. <clears throat> so in, in religions, they, they, they tend to absolutize relativity, reify conditioned phenomena and make it more than what it is. Where with wisdom, we're, we're aware of that, that my view of what's right is like this, you know, it comes and goes. It's, re it's relative to other conditions. And it's not a permanent, you know, if I grasp it from the ignorant level, from ignorance of Dhamma, then I become a very righteous person, personality. It always has to be right. And, you know, you encounter people like this where, you know, they argue because they always determine that they're right and they've got to prove that they are right, that you're wrong. And you try to hold a conversation with them, it's impossible. So because they've already fixed their position. They don't listen. They aren't aware. There's no wisdom in their p holding the position. It's just an ideal and a belief that they grasp because beliefs, all beliefs are sankharas, are conditions, are phenomena. And, uh, and that's where it is this uh, kind of vipassana style of insight practice where you're investigating phenomena, where you, know, you begin to see, notice, recognize phenomena, thoughts, are phenomena, memories are phenomena, emotions are phenomena, the bodies are phenomena. So, you know, these are our conditions or forms that arise and cease, burn, born and die, begin and end. <clears throat> and this is where the practice of patient endurance is encouraged in, in meditation to, to relax and, and observe, be the witness, the puto, the witness of phenomena as it arises and ceases. And if, if you're just aware when it arises, then you grasp, you know, if you, if you have a righteous position to take and you grasp it, you don't see the cessation of righteousness. You, aren't, you have no insight into the way things are. You just fix yourself with a, with a karmic connection to what you consider right view and hold that against all odds, against all discussion, against the wisdom itself. So, you know, it's like cultural conditioning is very strong because that is what you get when you're an innocent child from your mother and father, from your family, from your social identity. And uh, it's, and, and we can't help but have this, this, this sense of, you know, what my generation, how I was brought up, my view of morality, my view of religion, my view of what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. And, and, and then, you know, like a, an atheist who doesn't believe in God is still taking a belief. You don't, you, you don't investigate what God really is. You know, it's a word, three letter word in, in, in the English language. But what, what do you mean by that? So somebody asks you, do you believe in God? You know, and if you say, no, I don't, uh, then, you, you, you know, you've just taken, uh, you don't believe what they believe or what the traditional religious take on the word God is. So you're considered an atheist, a heretic, or, you know, an atheist are bad and believers are good. And so you, you divide the experience into this, into two sides of one opposing the other. And you're lost in that is what samsara vata is, what 
the samsara, the world of delusion that we live in, if we don't develop and assign, uh, depend on religion, we just depend on wisdom as our guide. Like in the tradition that we're from, the Pali Theravada tradition, that wisdom is, is Dhamma, is reality itself. So it's not something that, that we lack, that we, we don't have. We just don't notice it when we're bound into the conditioned reactions that we've developed from our early childhood, innocent period where we just absorb everything, whether it's right or wrong is, is not so much the issue. You just take in what you're told is right and what, and you believe that anything opposed to that is wrong. You don't question. You don't investigate right and wrong. So we have, you know, amongst all the idealists in the world, and you know, we, we, you know, it's interesting to, to be a monk, uh, an American bhikkhu in Thai tradition, because, you know, your whole American cultural conditioning is quite challenged by it. And, uh, you know, because it's very different cultural conditioning when you're living in a Thai forest monastery in Northeast Thailand and a very conservative traditional form of, of Theravada Buddhism and but very investigative, like Lung Kho Cha was, was always encouraged this investigation into observing, being the witness of the, how things rise and cease and conscious awareness. So in, you know, in the training as a Buddhist monk within a very conservative, very strict uh, disciplinary code that was n not part of my life in any way before when I was a lay person living in California. Uh, and, you know, it was a kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool and surviving because uh, you know, one had, you know, I was very idealistic, conditioned to be very idealistic. And so I, as a, as a graduate student at Berkeley, I was very much into peace movements and things like that, marching for peace, protesting against war, protesting against the Atomic Energy Commission, protesting for freedom of speech, and, you know, a very <clears throat> liberal, idealistic, cultural conditioning, social conditioning that I'd received. And, uh, you know, one was so critical as a student of the American political system, of, of Christianity, of, of everything that, that I'd been brought up to totally accept as the best and right because the American cultural conditioning is very righteous as well as the Christian one. So you're brought up with this very strong sense of right and wrong and what's, you know, belief in progress and, and uh, belief in God and belief in, in democracy. You know, these are all very beautiful ideals as such. But, you know, it leaves you emotionally kind of totally confused because life isn't an ideal experience. There's no country, an ideal country, no ideal religious form. They are conventions. All religious forms are conventions. They arise and cease. They begin and end. They're not absolute. But religion at its best is pointing to God or to Dhamma or to ultimate reality rather than defining it. And this is where this witnessing position is, is, uh, is an encouraged way of investigating to be the observer rather than the participator, the believer, the, the one who believes or disbelieves or take, passes judgments on in every condition that you experience. Then what a, I'm assuming that if we have become accustomed 
to live with self-righteousness as part of our cultural conditioning. And maybe something that's quite difficult to recognize at first. It's not very really difficult <laughs> if you trust your awareness. Because, you know, being right, when, you know, just for me, it was quite obvious how much I suffered by my righteous views. Because life wasn't conforming to my ideal of what's right. I wasn't able to conform as a person, as an individual, as a citizen, as a member of a religion, you know, and yet I held these ideals, they're beautiful ideals, I'm not condemning them. Democracy is a great idea, and so is Christianity, and so is God, and, and freedom, and individual rights, and, and all these are, you know, as ideals, they're, they're the best you can possibly create, you know, with words, with thoughts. So they inspire, you know, they inspire the, you know, the superlative speeches, righteous speeches, or it can be very inspiring to people because people are confused and ignorant. And so, you know, somebody that seems very confident, very sure of themselves of the right path or the right way or the right view can be very, you know, compelling, charismatic through being very righteous and opinionated. We can see that in modern politics today. The, this, uh, the, this, how charismatic being convinced that you're totally right uh, draws in uh, millions of people into that particular position when they don't know what they're doing. They haven't a clue of what, what right is, but somebody that says, I know what's right on how to, how to lead the world and save the, the democracy and save religion and, that, then the, and what is the true religion, what is the ultimate religion, you know, and is religion right or wrong? And atheists can be very convincing, you know, because they're so rational. <laughs> and, you know, on a rational level, you know, you can't prove God as something, an objective form that you, you can hold out or describe as an object. So all the anthropomorphic manifestations uh, of God, you know, can be easily condemned, you know, or rejected. Like the old man white beard up in the sky. You know, that's like Santa Claus. You know, it's, it's believable when you're quite an innocent child, but as you grow older, you, you realize it's, it's just a myth. And uh, so, you know, this, this, freedom that the Buddha encouraged in his, in his teachings that are pointing towards reality here and now is, is very uh, much appreciated because it's not a belief system. Buddhism itself, can, anybody can believe all kinds of Buddhist ideals and, and, you know, realms of deities and bodhisattvas and arahants and, you can believe in the in the words and the, the scriptures, but the actual teaching of the Buddha is this investigation. You know, words are created conditions. They're phenomena. You know, the language is a created function. And where consciousness is not created, you don't create consciousness. It's not a, you know, a Buddhist consciousness and a Christian consciousness or a personal Ajahn Sumedho consciousness that's, that's separate from Ajahn Asoko's consciousness. You know, I can believe that, you know, on a belief level. And, you know, if that's what I've been told and I don't question or investigate the present moment, the reality of here and now, then I, I believe what I'm told. Because the teachers, uh, the masters say so, the, the priests, the imams, the 
rabbis, everybody says what's right and what's wrong and what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe in. And, you know, one quite innocently accepts all that. But this is a time for awakening to the way things are. And so this is so succinctly stated by the Buddha 2,564 years ago in India, when he said, you know, all conditions are impermanent. Now that's not a doctrine. You know, as a doctrine, and it's not very inspiring. Because, you know, it's, it, it's uh, you know, what does that mean? All conditions are impermanent. What is a condition? What is a sankara? What is nibbana? <clears throat> you know, you don't question that. You just say that if you practice according to this right way that I teach, and then you'll realize nibbana, ultimate reality. You can believe that, and it's, and that can be inspiring to get us started on the path, or started in the practice of stilling the mind or waking to silence of the present moment. But, um, you know, it's still, belief is, is, is a condition we create. And in Buddha, Buddha Dhamma, you know, it's a, it's a convention. Religions are conventions. Languages are conventions. Thoughts, memories, imagination is all thought created. And, and so the, the present moment, the here and now reality, is Dhamma, you know, so it's, it's empty, and you can't find it. You can't find Dhamma or consciousness as an object. You know, where is it? And the one thing you know at this moment that everybody knows, no matter how, how ignorant they might be in their belief systems, is that they know they're conscious. But where is it? Can you find it? Can you define it? And then space itself is here and now. So it's, you know, it's like what unifies Ajahn Asoka and myself at this very moment is space and consciousness. We're both in space. The kuti, the, the shelter I'm living in is in space. Amravati is in space. The planet Earth is in space. Space has no no boundary, no limitation. And it's here and now. And it allows for everything to be right and wrong, good or bad, good or evil, heaven or hell, angels or devils. You know, any any condition can arise and cease in space. Because conditioned phenomena, samsara, is about birth and death. All conditions are impermanent. <laughs> so when we take our position as a witness, being the aware, the puto, the Buddha, the aware of the present moment is like this. Notice it's not judging it, it's not saying that this is the best moment, or this is a real moment, or my moment, or my space. But it's, it's not claiming space in, as any personal property. A conscious awareness is not a personal property. You don't create it. You create yourself as a person with thoughts, with memories, with beliefs. The ego, the, con the cultural conditioning, the thinking process is all about creating, believing, and, and grasping these changing conditions as our reality. You're making them more than what they are in the present moment. So, in, you know, like a righteous view right now might be even right for the present moment. It's not saying that 
that it can it's all right is wrong you know but it's wisdom to know when right is is appropriate when my right view my view that i believe is right is appropriate to manifest in in speech or action that takes wisdom patience reflective ability to to know how to respond to conditions in the present moment that would that arise and you can only do that through awareness of the of the nature of conditioned phenomena as you you experience it as it comes and rises and ceases in the present as we usually fall for beautiful ideals like you were mentioning democracy and human rights and saving the planet and what are really religious views We get blinded by that kind of attractiveness. It kind of grabs the attention. And then that's when we tend to fall for this self-righteousness in the position, grasping it. So how can we train oneself to notice this self-righteousness and sort of step back a bit from all the glitziness of the ideals or the positions or whatever it is we're feeling self-righteous about? To trust your awareness of them. You know, like I, I would, because of my righteous conditioning, cultural conditioning, religious conditioning, I have, I, you know, I would feel I'm right and feel, and I, this sense of being right or misunderstood or, or you know, when somebody doesn't agree with me, this sense of being offended or hurt or angry. And being rejected or or put down by some other righteous person, you know these emo these are emotions that 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 you know we tend to get caught into the sense of being offended by life, by experience of the past, by people disagreeing with us, by being criticized or looked down on or not being appreciated, not being recognized in the way that that you feel would be right. And and just by reflecting in this way, you begin to observe that that this is all about me and mine, this sense of me as a, as this physical body. Ajahn Sumedho is a separate entity in the universe. And the in the universe that that uh, you know tends to intimidate and not go along with all my righteous positions you know so they find relief from this righteousness through observing it being a witness trusting in awareness because righteousness this feeling of righteousness so if it's present it also ceases and that takes patience rather than you know trying to just get wallow in self pity or or your own righteous views and and hating the, the side uh, the person that doesn't agree with your view is is uh, samsara you know it's misery it's suffering to be caught in the in the momentum of emotional habit patterns of being a separate entity in a in a vast universe in space it, you know is is uh, you know it's a very threatening way to experience life you know because you we do feel quite helpless as as a separate individuals you know what can i do to save the planet what can i do to to save democracy in america what can i do to keep the purity of the Theravada Buddhist tradition. What can I do, you know, as a person, you know, and you get caught up in, in plans and, and uh, ideas, some of them good, some of them pointless. But what is, a, you know, there's awareness of this, that the thinking process is like this, this whole sense of me as a separate, individual in the universe 
you can witness that. I, I would deliberately, intentionally think me, because somehow that pr pronoun tends to emphasize the separateness. What about me? Do you care about me? Do you acknowledge me? You should respect me. And and this this said you know just as I think this these 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 words, this sense of me. You know suddenly stands out as a creation. Because in in awareness there's no me. There's no Ajahn Sumato. There's just pure conscious awareness, which is liberating. Nibbana, it's freedom. Where if I operate solely from Ajahn Sumato, Robert Jackman memories, then at old age, you know, I'm stuck with that, you know, without ever getting free from it, you know, until I drop dead, physically drop dead, without get, getting any the wiser. Because old people, we have so many memories of our past, of our childhood, of our teenage, of our youth, middle age, you know, and, and, uh, and our life in, in, in professional terms or in monastic terms. Uh, our feeling, you know, the emotions that were early conditioned in childhood still operate in old age. You know, it's so easy to feel offended personally. If somebody starts arguing with me, it's so easy to feel offended and, and exasperated or just frustrated or, you know, these kind of mental states are observable if you trust awareness. And I remember having insight in the early years in Thailand as a monk and feeling totally confused by my life there. Uh, you know, because it was so different from the conditioning I'd experienced in, in America. Such a totally different lifestyle than, than 1960s Berkeley. And uh, and yet I deliberately chose this this style. You know, was it? I wasn't forced into it. I wasn't. God wasn't held to my head to ordain, and I had to request it. And uh, so I put myself in this position quite intentionally, because I did have a lot of trust in Buddhism, Buddha Dhamma, and so the confusion of learning another language, learning uh, different cultural attitudes and reactions to life, you know, that tended to confuse me or uh, offend me or boggle my mind, you know, what's going on here? And uh, Ajahn Chah's own emphasis on being the awareness of it. So, you know, I could begin to just be aware of confusion. It's like this, feeling totally confused about what I should do, how I should practice, about the Vinaya rules, about the tradition I'm in, about whether I should stay or leave, you know, total confusion and doubt. And, and uh, you know, I began to see in through trusting in this awareness that these mental states, emotional reactions to, to experiences that are changing. And then you question yourself, what doesn't change is the awareness. Because if you trust your awareness, then your confusion, you know, is present, but it doesn't stay. Try to stay confused, you know, you have to keep holding on to it and confusing your mind with more thoughts. <laughs> but if you stop that, just observe confusion, mental, emotional confusion is like this, being aggravated, being doubt, doubt-ridden, 
confused by the at the present moment is like this. It's a it's another sankara, another phenomena, phenomenon that comes and goes. And you begin to recognize, remember, recognizing the absence of confusion. As I accepted it and didn't try to get rid of it, didn't try to get the answer or the solution to the answer to the question, the solution to the problem, just stayed confused, kind of embracing it, allowing it confusion to be like this. It stopped. There was silence. And then I affirm non-confusion is like this. You know, it's empty. And questioning your own existence, Ajahn Sumato. You know, what is Ajahn Sumato? Or Sumato, because in the early years I wasn't an Ajahn. So, where does Sumato arise and cease? And when there's no thought of Sumato or me, there's still conscious awareness and it's peaceful. And that's one thing I've begun to really appreciate how peaceful monastic life is if you trust the awareness. So monastic life isn't just, you know, as uh, blind conformity to rules and, and precepts and belief systems. It's a whole, you know, as it's meant to be, as Lumpa Cha encouraged, an investigation of experience. And experience is always Sankara. Right now, it, it's, it's, you know, thoughts arise and cease, emotions come and go. The weather changes, the time changes, you get older, the body gets older, you get criticized, you get praised, life goes on in its various manifestations, experiences that become memories of the past or dreads or fears or hopes for the future. You know, so like, what does an old monk like me hope for in the future? You know, when you're old like this, you, you like to, to sit in samadhi and just pass out. You know, it's an imaginary, imaginary perfect death for a Buddhist monk. You know, they have the report say, I found Rajan Samoto sitting in full lotus, but he passed on to Nibbana. <laughs> peacefully. He died peacefully. He didn't die. He just disappeared. <laughs> I mean, these are all kind of ways of talking <laughs> and hopes. <laughs> you know, personal hopes. <laughs> but, and that's, you know, the future is the unknown at this moment. The, the hope is a, is a, is a condition about the future. Hope is not about now, because the now is like this. But hope is everything's going to go well, everything okay, Ajahn Asoka, and you say, yes, everything's fine, everything's okay, and they thank you. <laughs> Hoping that you say everything's okay, <laughs> because if you say no, there's all kinds of problems and crises you've got to solve, and then the that presents another emotional problem arising in the present that isn't okay. But the awareness of okay or not okay isn't okay, it's like this. It's peaceful, you know, it's, it's embracing. Like consciousness includes everything, it's not, it isn't divisive. It's not embracing righteousness and goodness. And, and rejecting evilness, evil or Satan or, sad, or badness. Awareness knows that evil and good are conditions, are phenomena 
that arise and cease. And so our trust is in awareness rather than in a particular position we take on the condition level. And that's freedom. That's peace, peace, peace of mind. Escaping the perplexities of the world is through this awareness. Because the world is complex. It's perplexing. Just listening to the news in the morning on BBC, the, it's all so complicated. And who's right and who's wrong? You know, Israelis or Palestinians or Syrians or Hamas or Taliban or Americans or the European Union or Putin or Lushenko or the Germans or the Japanese. <laughs> you know, it's all very confusing when you when you, you know, you're listening to news because you might have preferences and sides that you, you prefer over one side over the other, but it's not necessarily wisdom. It's wisdom when you realize that, that by grasping conditions, grasping phenomena is the cause of suffering. So even the most righteous, perfect forms that we can imagine and create with thoughts, with ideas, in themselves are empty phenomena. You know, they have no real reality in themselves. So like democracy, human rights, all these are, uh, are you know, beautiful ideas. And they're directional, you know, like, Democracy is a, is a good direction to go toward. It's sort of like a guiding star. It's perfect. It gives you direction. But, you know, if you just depend on guiding stars for your life, you're going to fall off the cliff, drown in the ocean. <laughs> and that's suffering. And that's nothing to do with the star, which is beautiful and perfect. So the ideal of democracy, human rights, they're, they're perfect forms, but they are forms. And it's, and it's wisdom to realize that they're limited, where the reality that we can, that we re take refuge in is conscious awareness here and now, which is not an ideal, it's not a created form, it's not a condition. But it is here and now, and you know it, you know you're conscious. That's a fact that you, you don't question. And then here and now in consciousness, self-righteousness is what? And what? Self-righteousness is what? When it's just... It's just the idea. Just the condition that you might be grasping. <clears throat> and to investigate that grasping of I'm right, Observe it, this sense of me, Ajahn Sumedho, I have to be right. Is, you know, when you really observe that, when you, and not to deny it, but just this feeling of me alone in the universe as a separate, as a vulnerable separate form like this, being right is very lonely and disappointing at 86 years old. <laughs> you know, if I've spent all these years trying to prove I'm right as an individual form, that would be a terrible disappointment. And because, you know, what if the future is the unknown and it definitely this the, the, the the death of the forms, and and so, so that awareness of the cessation of thoughts of uh, the limitation of ideals is arising and ceasing rather than as absolutes. 
the, the realization that your real refuge in Buddhist terms is Dhamma. It's perfect here and now. Like Dhamma is not some abstract uh, metaphysical theory that Buddha thought up. It's the reality of here and now, conscious awareness here and now. And we awaken to that and suddenly we realize that's our real refuge, not in our righteous views or, or our fears and hopes for the future. So in old age, you, you look back and you have all these memories but they all seem like like waves floating in the water. Waves about the sea wind steers, flakes of glad foam. <laughs> and that, that's all they are, you know. So they're, they're not like absolutes that one holds to no matter what, just and become disillusioned or cynical or bitter about life, about experience, because we learn from the way things happen to us, whatever karmic conditions we have to live with. You know, karma is about condition phenomena. The law of karma is cause and effect. What arises ceases, what is born dies. So the physical body is a karmic form and its nature is as it was born long time ago, it's going to die in a few years. You know, is that, you know, and if that's my identity at this old age, I'll be a sad old man. Or wanting to die, you know, to get out of this trap. Maybe, it, you know, if you believe in oblivion is the ultimate result of when you're dead, you're dead and that's it. You know, there's nothing, just void, emptiness, you totally disappear. That's another belief. Oblivion is a belief, as well as heaven and hell, as well as samsara and nibbana. But these are just terms that we use not to grasp, but to reflect upon, to see that terms are not reality that reality is conscious awareness here and now. It's peaceful, it's perfect, it's Dhamma. Thank you very much, Nepal.